Well, good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you. Um, thank you very much for coming out this evening, and uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. That was very kind. Uh, so I am Professor Fiona Clark. The professor's quite new, and I'm still kind of giggling about it, um, but I'm very honoured that Cranfield have, have given me that title, basically for doing presentations like this, but on some of their courses. So um, hopefully I can share some of that with you this evening. Um, it's difficult to title this presentation because the world of electronic warfare is black art, black magic, invisible, um, but it's about protecting those who protect us. So the title hopefully gives you a clue. And what I'd like to do this evening is just take you through some of the key aspects of electronic warfare uh, and give you a view of what it is we do and how we do it. Um, so I'm going to cover a number of sections this evening. And as I was thinking how to present this, I thought I'd run it as a series of questions. Um, who, what, where, when, how, and so on. So the first one, these are slightly contrived, but the first one will be, well, who am I? Uh, and what's Leonardo about? And then we'll work through why do we need electronic warfare? What is it? How does it actually work? What do we do? Um, and importantly, where are we going in the future? So that's my plan. Um, if anyone has any worries about it, please shout. If you have any questions, please do ask them as we go. I might defer them to the end or later in the presentation. Uh, and if you have general questions, please keep them till the end. I'll try and keep within an hour. Um, if that's all right, but I'll leave some time at the end, hopefully for questions. Um, so who am I? Well, um, yes, those of you who may remember Marconi will know that that company name disappeared some years ago. So I joined back in the mid 80s. Uh, I was four when I went to university. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, <clears throat> I'm slightly older than you might think. Um, and I joined a company that was Marconi, not knowing what an engineer was really. I'd done maths, not knowing what systems were, but I became a systems engineer and I thought I'd stay two years and leave. So 38 years later, I'm still there. The company's changed names lots of times, but I'm still there. Um, but I've always been involved in electronic warfare, doing some modeling work, simulation work, um, trying to assess what we might be building and how it might work and work better. Um, and I spend as much time as I possibly can going on trials, sometimes to exciting places in America, quite often not. Um, but you'll often find me scrabbling around random funny tank-like looking things like that one. Anybody in the room know what that thing at the top right is? You're not allowed to answer. Good, that's all right. I don't have to shoot anyone. That's fine. Um, it's actually an SA-8 surface-to-air missile, number eight weapon system. It's a Russian system. It's kind of old now. That one's parked in Carlisle, just in case you're worried about the Russians coming this far over. Um, it's a gatekeeper at one of the bases, so it sits there just through the gate and looks menacing. Um, and it's one we acquired in a previous conflict. Uh, and I am the short one. I am always the short one in these photographs. Um, middle photo is our trials aircraft, so we fly around the UK scooping up data and working out if our equipment will work. And the bottom one is up in Lossiemouth. Uh, that's uh, an aircraft called the Protector, that's what UK is calling it. So they've just taken uh, delivery, sorry, Holly's doing this to my head, um, just taken delivery of the first of the Protector um, remotely piloted air systems. We're not allowed to call them drones and we're not allowed to call them unmanned air vehicles because they're unpersoned air vehicles. So they're ARPAS, remotely piloted air systems. And again, I'm the short one in the middle, um, but we have some equipment that we put on there and we were playing with. So, so that's what I like to do is go play with stuff. Um, I work for Leonardo. I'm not going to give you a, a long discourse on Leonardo, um, but just to say that we've come through Marconi, Celex, Finn Mechanica, uh, and we've acquired various bits along the way, like Westlands. Um, GEC Marconi came from a long line of other well-known engineering companies. Um, and we are now a top 10 global defence and aerospace company, which for our little island is pretty good going. Um, we do work with the Italians as well. We let them in. Um, they think it's their company. We might think slightly differently. Perhaps we'll cut that bit from the video. Um, <laughs> um, and there's some things on the screen there that go, basically, we, we've got sites around the UK. My bid is based in Luton and we've got a satellite at Lincoln uh, and we're involved in electronic warfare. But we have Edinburgh that look at radars, Basildon that look at land systems and electro optics, um, Yeovil make helicopters, Bristol do some cyber work um, and Southampton do communications and stuff. So we're a really broad reaching company um, that look after lots of aspects of communications and, and aircraft and electronic warfare and so on. 
Um, so our site is based in Luton in a capability green um, business park, and that's our front of our building. And there's about 800 people who work there, mostly engineers, um, but some other things as well. Lincoln, we have an academy which, where we do training and programming and, and stuff like that. OK, that's enough company stuff. Um, so electronic warfare, why do we need it? So our tagline at the minute is protecting those who protect us. And you'll all be aware of the conflict that's going on at the moment. Um, we're not really directly involved in that too much, but we're often involved in conflicts that the UK believes we need to be involved in. Um, involving many aircraft like this, in which there are UK citizens from the RAF or the Army flying around in danger. Now, they're protecting us, whether or not we believe in the situation. We voted the politicians in, we've sent them there. So they are doing their best to protect UK, and therefore we want to protect them. We basically need to know that they have equipment on board those aircraft that tell them where the bad guys are, um, whether they're a problem, and then bring them home safely. So that's our tagline, and we put stuff on all of those aircraft, um, including the nice white one in the middle that you can see now. Um, so, OK, we're going to protect them. What from? So if you think about something that's attacking an aircraft, you're probably thinking about something like this. There's a missile on the way, gunfire potentially, but generally a missile. We see it through Hollywood movies all the time. Something gets launched, it comes up to your aircraft, destroys it or you counter it. But actually, that's not the thing I worry about. I mean, I do worry about that bit, um, but that bit is being guided towards the aircraft by something else. If you just shoot a missile into the air and I move, it'll miss me. So something is telling that weapon where to go, and that's the bit that I'm worried about. What's the bit that tells it where to go? What's the bit that finds me in the sky in the first place, that tells the weapon system the aircraft is there and it's manoeuvring like this and then guides the missile to hit the aircraft. That's the dangerous bit. Now, if I can keep that bit in a state where it doesn't know where I am or it's looking in the wrong place, then either the missile goes to the wrong place or better, it stays on the ground. And if the missile is on the ground, it doesn't kill me. So that's what I want to do. Are you all aware, by the way, that missiles are called missiles because they're designed to miss? Did you not know that? Excellent. I've taught Ollie something today. Um, missiles, the derivation of the word missile is actually misere, which is to throw. But there used to be missiles and hitiles. And missiles were designed to miss, get close, go bang. That's not very nice. And hitiles were designed to hit. Um, they now all just get called missiles. But it really, really irritates people from MBDA and the like. If you say, well, your missiles are designed to miss. So, you know, what's the problem? So is anyone here from MBDA this evening? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> don't take that personally. Um, so top right picture, I, I won't tell you where that is, but you probably know. The yellow and red circles on that picture are the engagement capability of weapon systems that are set there, ready to defend that bit of land. So if you're trying to get near something there to do your task, whether that's taking out a communication system or whether that's dropping supplies to people in trouble, there's an awful lot of red and yellow circles that will be covering where you're going. And each of those red circles is one of those weapon systems, one of those systems on the ground using, in this case, radar to find you and then launch a missile at you. And that's our problem. So that's why we need some EW. So what is EW? OK, so I thought I'd go straight in with the physics. Actually, they're not too worried about that. That's excellent. Marvellous. Um, we're not going to do too much physics, but we'll do a little bit. So radars use something called electromagnetic energy. Um, we're interested in the radars. There, there are things that use infrared or laser, but, but our main work is radars. Um, and the system on the ground, the radar system, the weapon, will use some radar energy to find you and tell, you, tell its weapon where you are. So we're concerned with electromagnetic energy. Now, you're using electromagnetic energy right at this moment. Um, the people in the room are really seeing a radar operating because you've got a light source over here that's projecting an image onto the screen that's reflecting off the screen and is then coming back into your eyes. And your eyes are going, what is that wiggly thing doing on the screen and why is it wiggling? So you have a transmitter, you have a reflecting source or reflecting thing and then you have a processor which is your brain that works out what's going on 
that's what a radar does. Now, it may have the transmitter and the processor at the same place, like in our weapons, or it may have a radar on the ground that's illuminating an aircraft and the reflection is going to the missile that's guiding in on the reflection. So that's just like a weapon system. We're using light. They just use a different bit of the spectrum. Um, the people are online are looking at a screen that is transmitting and then that's coming into their eyes and they're processing that and then working out what they're seeing on the screen. So that's a bit more like our job. The, the transmission from the screen is the radar and my eyes are then the, the listening device, the, the EW system that's going, oh, what am I seeing in there? But it's all the same physics. It's about energy going from a place to another place, reflecting, coming back or being detected. So you know all about this stuff. You're already doing this. So the spectrum being a spectrum includes a whole load of different types of electromagnetic energy. And we tend to live in the microwave region. And it is where your microwave oven works. If you turn around to the back, you'll see either a wavelength or a frequency. And that will be in the middle of the bit that says microwaves in there. And that's actually where radars operate. So same kind of thing. Um, and we always do say if you're working with a radar, don't sit in front of the antenna for too long because you are sitting in front of a microwave generator and you will be cooked. And we have had instances of um, antennas on top of buildings that have been run overnight. And in the morning, the guys go up and find pigeons sat in front of the radar antenna, but slightly cooked and not very alive anymore. So um, it's not really a good place to be. So what we're going to do today for the, this lecture is we're just going to worry about the radar bit, my bit. So things like this, um, the top screen is the antenna set from um, the SA-8 missile, the one I mentioned before. Um, all those different antennas do different jobs. We'll have a look at what those might be in a sec. Um, and the one on the bottom is more likely to be a, an acquisition radar, a big thing that's just looking to go, where is everything? Oh, that one looks interesting. I'll pass that one to the weapon system to now engage. OK, so we've got stuff going on that's nasty and threatening. We're flying into danger. We've got to listen out for those beams. We've got to hear the radars when they're transmitting and we've got to figure out what's going on. So listening to all the radars in the environment and there could be hundreds of them. There may be few, but there could be hundreds. And we've got to unpack them all and tell the pilot what's out there. Um, so how do we do that? How do we tell him what's out there? Um, well, we use something called a radar warning receiver. And one of the nice things about our world is that everything is a bit of a Ron Seal moment. It does exactly what it says on the tin. So a radar warning receiver is a receiver that warns you of radars. Marvellous. So it's going to listen to that radar energy, those bursts of radar energy, unpack them all and then put them on the screen. So imagine for, for the rest of this lecture that you're all the bad guys. I'm clearly the, the nice, good person in my aircraft, clearly. I'm not sure about Ollie yet. I'll make my mind up in a minute. Um, but you're all transmitting radar energy to try and find me, potentially to shoot at me. So you know what you're doing. You know what you're, you're transmitting. And it's like you're all playing different tunes on the radio. You know what tune you're playing and therefore what to listen back for. But all I know is I'm getting this cacophony of sound hitting me and I've got to unpack that. So I have to separate you all out and then go, all right, there's a one over there playing this and another one there playing that. And that's the job of my radar warning receiver. Now, if we had several hours, I could tell you how we do that. But sadly, we haven't got the time this evening. We'll have to do that another time. But just suffice to say, we can do that. We can unpack it all and put it on a screen. Um, generally, these things are very small screens. They're tiny, about yay big. And all they're going to have is a few little symbols that go SA-12 that way, missile that way, looks clear that way, I'd go that way if I were you. And they are literally a, where are the bad guys? What state are the bad guys in? Are they just looking? Or actually, are they guiding a missile? Can I hear that guidance signal? And if so, run away, get away, counter it or something. Um, so little picture of Leonardo boxes. Obviously, I'm going to use Leonardo examples because I don't have anybody else's, um, but that's our little radar warning receiver. So the antennas are about yay big round. Um, the box in the middle is a little square box like this, cuboid, and the other little devices sit behind the antennas. So very small, very light. Put antennas around your aircraft so you can pick energy up from all around you, process it in the box, put it on the screen. Job done. So you're now flying along and you've at least got notice of what is out there and whether it's a problem. So that's great. Actually, that's enough for you to decide, do I keep going 
or do I need to get out of here quickly because there's something really bad and it's guiding a missile at me? So it's a good enough stage. But how do you know what symbol to put on the screen? How do we know to put the 12 or the M or the arrow or whatever the thing is? Well, we've got to tell it because it's just a box and it's just got a software algorithm in it that says, well, I've seen this kind of thing or I've heard this kind of tune being played, but how it knows what it is, well, we program it. So we use data and um, in the UK, we have a national set of databases up in RAF Waddington, and that contains the UK's total knowledge of what's out in the world. Um, other countries have a similar thing, so they have their own national database. And some of that is classified data, and some of it is actually um, just open source stuff. If you're interested in radars and weapons and how they work, I recommend you go and look on the Australia Air Power website, Aussie Air Power. There is a phenomenal amount of stuff in there about weapon systems and how they operate and what they do. And, and, and I kind of read it thinking, is this really supposed to be here in a public release or thing? OK, um, so you can find a lot of stuff from there. So that data is the, the kind of the some knowledge, you know, that's like our Spotify or our Shazam. So, you know, there's a tune playing. I can Shazam it and it will go, oh, that's Whitney Houston playing. How will I know or something like that? From our point of view, we take that data and we, we provide programming tools that go, well, I'm going to fly here today. This is my mission. So I want to head off over that bit of land. I'm expecting there to be these kind of systems there because you know, I've got a bit of knowledge of who has what. So I use my mission planning to go, going to fly there. That's what I think is in there. And I pull out from my system specific data. OK, these are the emitters that I'm expecting to see. What do I want to do? If I see this, do I put it on the screen? Um, if it's in this mode, do I alarm? Do I, you know, ding a ding a ding at the pilot to say there's something really bad and those kind of decisions. So that works in that little line that goes over to mission data production. So we create a set of data for that mission and that's loaded into the, the system, the radar warner before it flies. So then when you go flying and you see something, hear that tune, we can go, all oh, right, in my library, I know that that characteristic means it's that missile system. I'll put that on the screen. So I've now completed that. And those of you of my generation who remember programming videos um, before the day, you could just go record that and everything magically happened um, where you had to know the channel and the, the what time it started. And you, know, you had to tell your mum and dad about six times before they worked it out. Um, it's kind of like that. It's programming in that step by step. What is it I'm looking for and how do I see it? So that there's two stages, really. There's mission data preparation, software tools to allow you to do that. Um, and then there's verification of that. So we do a bit of testing in a lab, uh, either with hardware in the loop or, or just a software version. And we test that if we simulate the environment containing the things we've programmed, do we get the right thing on the screen so the pilot will get the right idea? And then you go fly. Off we go. Marvellous. But how do we know what data to program? So I can program, but how do I know what that tune is and what parameters I should be programming? Um, where do I get that data from? Well, you can take your radar warning receiver and you can kind of put it on speed, add a few more clever bits, and then make it a listening device, a, a hoover, if you like, or a vacuum cleaner, probably shouldn't advertise hoovers. So with the same kind of concept of something that's going to listen out for what those emitters are, are doing, what those radars are doing. If we add a little bit more processing, a little bit more subtlety, then we can start to go out to the environment we're working in, record the data we're hearing out there and then analyze it so that we can then go, well, on that Tuesday when we were flying over there, this is what we recorded in terms of what my system will see. And out of the window, I eyeballed that there was a weapon that looked like this. Oh, that's one of those ones. So I can then go, well, that weapon has this characteristic and that's how I can build up that data. So for that, we need something a bit better than a radar warner, but it's kind of that and a bit more. Um, so they're called electronic support measures systems or ESM systems, and they're there to, to give you the warning, but also to do that data collect and to give you an idea of what is out in the world, not just the there's a bad thing run away, but here is everything. So I can pinpoint all of you guys. I can put you on a map and go, right, you're there, you're there, you're there. So it's kind of just a, a bit more, a bit better. So the kind of image you get for that, this is from a system we make called Sage, um, looks something like this potentially. This is this is 
a graphic that, that we tend to use and how I like to run this when I'm flying. So I've got a big map, very dangerous area we're flying over here, lots of threats, um, lots of things that are going to kill me, clearly. Um, and each of the yellow, red or blue blobs on that map is an emitter that I've detected. And remember, I'm just listening. I don't know what you're doing. I'm just hearing you. And I've unpacked that, worked out what it is, and then I've put it on the map to say this thing is there and this thing is there. So each of those little yellow, fluffy, bubbly things is a thing that I've seen. Um, the red ellipse, um, we've got a, a map that isn't quite spherical, it's not quite right. So the red ellipse tells me how far I should be able to see for my height. Um, we can detect as far as we can see with our systems and the world is not flat, it's round. Therefore, at some point, the, the edge of the world comes in and we can't see past that. Um, there's a famous um, advert for the Flat Earth Society that says, we have locations around the globe, which I just think is great. Love it. Long may it continue. Um, so that's the edge of what we could see. Um, down at the bottom, we've just got a listing that we can run through and get all the parameters out for what we're seeing. I have redacted a few of those because I'm not really supposed to put those on this kind of open source thing. And then on the left, we can then kind of pick one. And I've picked the one that's got the little black box around it and the line going through it. And that will then tell me all the parameters. So the tunes it's playing, what those individual bits of energy look like. The two blue blobs um, with this system, I can say, tell me exactly where this one is. And I can ask it to geolocate any of those emitters. So I've picked those two. Um, and then the system goes through a, a, a little process and it works out exactly where they are. And I like to think it's like um, when you had your toddlers and you had one of those five year old birthday parties that we all survived if we're lucky um, and you had 30 toddlers and they were all running around the garden in the daylight and then it got dark and mums come to pick one of them up and they're all screaming around the garden and you're kind of trying to find your one and there's no lights because of course you know I don't have lights in my garden and you've got to hear figure out which one is the right toddler and then be able to go right you you're going home with your mother. I don't actually pick children up like that and give them to their mother, um, but you get the kind of idea. And this is the same kind of thing. It's like there's so much going on, but I need to be able to find the individual one and go, right, you are actually just there and located. So that's that's that kind of concept in there. So a much nicer display. I get a picture, I can see what's in the world. Um, I can look at the, the parameters and I can start to go, okay, that is that thing and it looks like this. And if I want to look a bit more detail, then I can pull up the individual bits of energy that come into my system that make up you know, the, what's coming out of that radar. And I can group all those and say, right, this radar does this. It has this characteristic. This is how the things chain. Um, so the red, the greens and the pinks just tell me which bit of the system they've come through. The bit that's kind of white, these are different um, parameters I'm showing. So one is frequency, one is width of pulse that they've transmitted, and the one that's moving up and down is power. So the white bit is a, a scanning emitter. And as it scans past me, I get a little bit of power and then I get more power and then it goes back to a little bit of power. So that little peak there and the little bobbly bits at the side are showing me that beam as it's scanning past me. And I can measure then how often that beam comes past and things like that. So this kind of system allows you to dig right down into what the radars are doing, measure them, identify what belongs to what, and then build up your library with all that data. And you can then go flying with better data. And we can upload data to these platforms live. So with that big white protector, MQ9B, we can see this, analyze it, decide how we wanna change the program, send it up while the thing is flying. So we can change data and be very, very current. Yes. Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's, uh, the case it wasn't audible there. So the question is, what's to stop these guys spoofing and spitting out something that isn't right? Um, nothing. There, there's something that's slightly different. What they tend to do is they tend to operate in a normal mode. But if you go to a war, they might just tweak things there. So I've got used to everything, got my library programmed, and then you go to war and all the parameters have changed. Laws of physics and engineering say they can't go too far. They can't suddenly do something completely different, but they can change. So these systems, the SAGE system, doesn't actually care what the parameters are. So if you give me something new, I'll just identify that as a new thing. 
I haven't yet been able to go, oh, that's you and you've played numbers, but I'll know you're there. I'll just identify it as an unknown. I haven't tagged it with an identifying. And that's where this comes in, because we can go, oh, what's the unknown? What's it doing? And you'll look at it and go, that looks suspiciously like that one, but slightly different. And then you usually need someone to actually eyeball it or see it and go, yeah, tick, it's definitely that. Um, so the adaptability is built into this. Excellent question. Um, OK, so this is about the what is it and, and how we get those parameters. But how do we find out where it is? Um, well, we use a, a clever little antenna set um, called a high accuracy direction finding antenna array, or HADF for short, um, and it's that gray thing on the side there. Can't go into too much detail clearly about how it works, but the thing is about this big, stick it on the side of an aircraft, um, and it's able to do some, wait for it, hoopy maths. This is my term that I'm trying to get into a publication somewhere, hoopy maths um, in there. So um, it doesn't really matter what it's doing. If, you, if you're interested, I'll talk to you afterwards, but perhaps not on the camera. Um, but it uses a, a very uh, physics related and very solid mechanism by which it can find angle very, very accurately, high accuracy direction finding. Um, and then if, as you fly a baseline, you fly along a little bit of space, you can measure angle, measure angle, measure angle, and then you can triangulate to where that system is. And if your angle me measurement is very accurate, then your triangulation can be very accurate as well. Um, we do this from one platform and we do this by listening. So back to the toddlers in the garden, I can just listen to the one toddler and know exactly where they are by doing that, that bearing sort of measurement. Um, so just an example for the screen. So this is Cambridge Airport. I'm sure any of you who've flown know exactly that airport. Um, so the ground truth is where the little blob is. And that's um, if you go to Google Maps, you can see the, the air traffic control radar. And our fix from our Sage equipment is the green box in the little square. Um, I can't tell you exactly where we were or how far or any of that stuff, but we were a reasonable distance away and we took not very long. We had to fly a baseline to give an angle. Um, but I think you can see just by listening, you know, if you were listening to sound only, that's pretty accurate from a little plane that's just flying around the sky completely quietly. We're not transmitting. So the weapon system will just think we're in that case a business jet. They won't even know we're listening or looking. And with the MQ-9B, it's so quiet and so high. Nobody will know it's there and it's able to do all this kind of location. So that's how we find the data. So going around our, our little um, EWOS life cycle, so electronic warfare operational support. So we did the programming to get something on the screen. We've now gone round. We're now analyzing what we saw, looking at the new things. You know, what is that? Where has it changed? And just double checking what we have is, is correct. So that takes us round the loop of being able to do all that listening. Um, what's out there? Where is it? Is it a problem? What are its modes and so on? So I can now give my pilot a really good picture. So as they're flying along, they know you know, whether they're safe, whether they're not, where the safe places are, and they can adapt to that. But what if something out there is not very nice? What if it's threatening, if it's gone into a mode where it's tracking you? So it's a weapon system. Generally, there'll be an acquisition bit scanning around to look at what's in the sky. And then when there's something that the weapon system thinks is threatening them because it's heading towards them, perhaps, then they'll put a tracker up and lock onto that aircraft. And that basically means that there's a radar signal it's not scanning anymore, it's staring. Um, and the radar processing allows it to put a box around the thing it's staring at. So if that's an aircraft and the aircraft moves, the box goes with the aircraft and they track where you're going. That's clearly threatening to us. And anything that is tracking us is likely to be doing so to work out whether it can shoot at us. So this is bad news. OK, so something threatening out there. I'm going to have to do something about it. Um, so here is my SA8 again. Uh, if you go to Duxford um, at all, round the back of their, I think it's outside still, which is a real shame, but out the back of their land vehicles building is, is one of these, and you used to be able to go and clamber over it and sit inside it. It's a really agricultural vehicle, you know, a bit metal, a bit kind of sit on an upturned bucket, not a lot of space. It's amphibious, so it can just drive through a river and out the other side. You don't need to find a bridge or anything. Um, and it can set up really quickly. Weapons are on that vehicle. All the antennas allow it, the top two allow it to scan, and the little array there allows it to stare and then shoot. So it's completely self-contained weapon system ready to shoot at you. 
So the kind of technique that this uses, um, and this is all, you can find these kind of techniques on, on Google and Wikipedia and stuff. So um, this uses something called command to line off site. So Ron Seal moment, it's going to command the missile to the line of sight from the weapon system that on the ground up to the aircraft. So if you have a missile that you launch and you then pull it onto the line of sight from you to the aircraft, wherever the aircraft goes, if the missile is on that line of sight, it will hit that aircraft. So that's the kind of concept. So lots and lots of signals involved in this, though. Hence, lots of antennas. So first of all, you've got to track the target. And that is the thing that puts a box and says the aircraft's there. I know where it's going. I'm going to follow it. Then you launch the missile. Out it goes. Um, you need to know where the missile is in order to do the left a bit, left a bit, left a bit, up a bit, get ready to go bang. So there's something on the missile, either a little um, little tiny signal that's coming out that's going, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I always have these very strange ideas about missiles. Um, or perhaps just looking at the heat at the back of the missile, but something that allows the weapon system to say it's there. And then you go, you're there, it's there, it needs to go left. So there's the command guidance signal that says go left, go left, go left, go up and so on. And all it does is it pulls that onto the line of sight until it gets back. You haven't got your sound on. <laughs> There's a really sad kind of sound on that, but luckily it's not on. Um, and that's that's it. That's, you know, that's how that weapon system type of thing works. So if we're in that aircraft, we don't want this to happen, clearly. Um, so we've absolutely got to be able to deal with the command guidance signal. We've got to make sure that pushes the missile somewhere else. But I'd really like to deal with the target tracker, because if the target tracker is looking not at me, then it will be guiding the missile in the wrong way. And if I can confuse it enough that it really doesn't know where anything is, the missile will stay on the ground. So our systems are going to have to understand how that works, understand all those different signals, and then be able to do something about one or many of those. Um, OK, so we get into the world of electronic countermeasures. So we've had electronic support measures, listening. Now we're electronic countermeasures. Um, and these tend to be grouped into electronic defense and electronic attack. It's all electronics, it's all wiggly amps. So the defense stuff is something that looks after me on my platform. Um, you're shooting at me, I'm going to defend myself. And the attack stuff tends to be perhaps a standoff aircraft that will be behind the, the battle, but it will be looking at the, the radars, the weapon systems on the ground, and it will be jamming those from a distance to stop them from being able to see the aircraft going forward. Similar techniques, slightly different operation. So we're in the problem. We've got something tracking potentially on the way. So what are we going to do? Um, well, if you watch any Hollywood films, you're going to chuck a load of flares out uh, and the missiles and the flares are going to do this kind of dance in the sky. And then all's going to be marvelous because the hero has to survive. Um, flares don't actually dance. They don't try and go to where the missile is. They literally just come out hot, as hot as they can. And the missile, you hope, will go to the hot thing. So a flare has to be, or a set of flares is never one, has to be hotter, more attractive, and burn bright enough to pull that missile towards it so that you can get away. Um, you quite often release a few and a few more and a few more to try and make sure that engagement works. Chaff works in a similar way for um, radars. So radars aren't looking for heat, they're looking for reflected radar energy. So we'll give them stuff that reflects. So tiny strips of aluminium foil or aluminized glass each one acts like a little dipole, like the old Yagi antennas on your roof that your telly used to come in through if you don't have cable. Um, each one of those little dipoles is a little reflector that built up signal. Um, and then you'd push that down to your telly. In the case of chaff, we'd lob out thousands of these strips and each one reflects and reflects onto the next strip. So you get something that looks actually like a physical size of an aircraft from a chaff cloud. We used it in World War Two. It's kind of a bit out of date now because most missiles and radars are, are able to go. Yeah, that's chaff. That's not an aircraft. Um, but you can still get some usage out of it. So these things are called passive um, because basically you just lob it out of the aircraft and it does what it does, hopefully working. But you can't do anything to it. It just is. So the, the flares are producing a heat source for a heat seeker and the chaff is producing a thing that looks like an aircraft. Um, the other thing you can do is use an active system. And this is where we come in in, in the really W. We produce 
electromagnetic energy back to the weapon system that looks like an aircraft or better than an aircraft. So there's various ways you can do this. You, you can just like the, the screen up there, you can just throw out loads of bursts of energy and just swamp the screen. So you'll all have seen on James Bond and stuff, you know, when they're looking for James Bond coming in, you have a radar sweeping around and there's a little beep as it goes past James Bond's aircraft, beep every time. If that was beeping, can you imagine how annoying that would be with every single one of those things going off? Um, but you're used to getting a nice clear, there's one aircraft, there's another. So if we just give the thing thousands, then the radar is going to get swamped that one's managing to put them on the screen. But which of those yellow blobs is the aircraft that they're interested in? That's really hard to find now. Um, bit unsubtle, though. They will know you're jamming them. Jamming is a common term for countermeasures. There's loads of stuff on that screen. Clearly, you're doing something. Therefore, there's a high value target in the area because it's jamming them. So they're now really alert and trying to find where that is. Um, so we'd kind of like to do things that are like maybe a little bit more subtle than that, but if needs must, we'll just chuck loads of data at it and that's fine. So electronic countermeasures is going to be throwing out energy to confuse um, or seduce a radar to look somewhere else at someone else. So that's what, what they are. Um, one of our directors coined the term digital stealth. Uh, it was in response to the F-35 aircraft that you know we've bought in the UK, uh, the invisible fighter as it's it's always shown stealthy invisible to radar um, it's very small very very small to radar um, but it's designed to work for today's radars so you know it's hard to find definitely is hard to find and it's exceptionally fast so it's in and out pretty quickly um, but of course what do the weapon systems designers do they go well we can't see it in this frequency band well, we'll just go there or here or we'll do something else. So, you know, we know as soon as you put anything like a stealth bomber or a stealth fighter out, everyone starts moving somewhere else. So we prefer not to try and make the physical aircraft stealthy. Well, small is good. Um, but what we do is digitally hide ourselves. So we're going to either put so much rubbish out in the in the surrounding world, lots more toddlers that you can't find the one you're interested in. Um, or we might just kind of go, well, look, there's something over there much nicer. Go that way, you know, and we'll just quietly disappear. So we go for a digital mechanism rather than a physical aircraft. Both have their uses. And um, I am slightly flippant about the F-35 because I don't make it, therefore. But um, that's what we're going to do. Um, so you kind of class these things in a couple of ways. There's noise jammers, which basically just shout noise, white noise, kind of stuff. So if you're trying to hear your tune or hear your toddler and all you've got is going on you can't hear them uh, and that's a little bit like what we've just seen on the screen so you just cover the whole of the screen for the operator in rubbish and he can't see through it to where your target actually is but it's brute force needs a lot of power and they'll know you're doing it so it's not the most subtle so you tend to have deception jammers and they are more likely to go um, something much much nicer just over here that way boys um, they can be um, some of these examples here are from older systems, so you can have a deception jammer on your aircraft, off your aircraft, combination. Um, so the, the bottom right image is of the Sky Shadow jamming pod. That was designed when I was five, started its design. Um, it's quite large. Our tornadoes have gone out of service, but they're still in service around the world. And Sky Shadow is still operating around the world. So have a look at your mobile phone today. Week forward 54 years. I've just given my age away, but you might have worked that one out. Um, Hoik forward all that time. And how much of the stuff we're using today do you think will still be operational in that time and still providing protection? It's, it's quite astonishing. Good engineering. Um, the top one is a naval decoy. So this is a system that if you and in the Falklands War, you may remember the Sheffield was taken out by an Exocet missile. Ships don't move very fast and they sit on the water. So if a missile comes anywhere near them, it's going to do damage. So we designed this thing, a naval offboard decoy. So as a missile is coming towards you, you put a decoy out on a parachute and it falls slowly down to the sea, not in front of you. And the missile follows it and therefore doesn't hit the big metal thing floating on the water. It's a really good thing. Um, the one in the middle is a towed decoy. Decoys are designed to decoy. They're not designed to make the missile go bang. They're not designed to make it go miles away. They're designed to pull that missile aim point onto the decoy. And that one is on a piece of string. 
behind the aircraft. So if the missile veers towards that towed decoy, the aircraft is safe. All basic deception techniques to pull the missile aim point away from you so that you remain safe um, and it goes somewhere else. The latest one we have is something called Bright Cloud. So Bright Cloud is an offboard active decoy, um, but it's an expendable one. It's not on a, a string that you can keep using. This is a, a device that is self-protection at the point you're being fired at, and you throw it out of your aircraft and it can pull a missile away. Um, this, is, this is not quite, here's one I prepared earlier, because this is not a real one. I can't get the lid off, um, but this is a space model of a Bright Cloud decoy. And you can tell that because it says bright cloud in big letters on the sides. Uh, the real ones don't have a red nose and bright cloud because we'd rather that other people don't find them when we drop them. But that is the size of a modern self-protection jamming system. So I'm being shot at, there's a missile on its way to me and I deploy this. It's got these little fins that ping out. All they do is keep the body stable so it doesn't tumble too far. And it comes out jamming, shouting, and it looks to that weapon system so much sweeter than you do and all it's going to do is make the aim point go that way and then it's just going to fall to the ground and they usually bury themselves right down in the ground so we can never find the things again um, but that is a bright cloud decoy this one is representative of size and weight so if you want to come up and have a have a fiddle later Ollie, can I just give you that to hang on to don't sit it on its fingers because it will break um, so that we designed that one many many years ago um, but the technology wasn't available no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, it can it can sit that way up, but not yet. It'll fall off. One of my um, best customers, who owns a multi-billion-pound customer uh, company, did that, and the thing fell off and broke. So it'll sit on its fins. Just do it carefully. Um, so that one we designed that fits into a standard chaff and flare dispenser, which are on most aircraft. So you can simply take out a, a chaff block and put in a bright cloud decoy, and go fly with that, and that will then defend you against all the missiles that we know about today. And as soon as we got to the point we could make that, every, all the technology came in, the batteries, everything else like that. And our first people who looked at it and said, yeah, but our dispenser isn't that size, it's that size. Oh, great, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so within no time at all, we had to design this one. This one is one I've dropped earlier. So these fins are not real and they break all the time. So this bright cloud is exactly the same as that in concept, but it fits into a two by one by eight dispenser. Good old inches for those of you who work in inches like what I do. Um, so that fits in a different dispenser, same concept. Take out what you've got, put this thing in, and that will protect you against a missile. And I think, you know, you can agree the cost of a Typhoon type aircraft against a little thing like that is quite astonishing. So again, excellent engineering. Don't have to worry too much about that one. Thank you, Ali. Okay, so that's Bright Cloud. Uh, we had a naming competition. All our systems are called Praetorian, Zeus, nice, gorgeous, you know, old names. And we put the naming competition out to the guys at work. And we're full of very lovely, very bright, very funny engineers. And a, a good friend of mine decided to go for something stupid. So he thought Bright Cloud. I'll spell bright, B-R-I-T-E. They'll never pick that, he thought. Um, and they did. So Bright Cloud, they are spelt B-R-I-T-E. Yes, sir. Um, it needs to be programmed for what you might expect to see. Um, all these engagements are so, so quick. So, you know, at the point that's coming out of your aircraft, it's got to be doing its stuff, finding what is tracking it and then um, jamming it at the time. So, yeah, you pre-program it um, with here are the things that you may come across in theatre and then it will find the one that's actually out there and, and jam that one. Um, if it's something you've never seen ever, ever, ever before, then it's got, it can do a default program that you just kind of, you know, fingers crossed hope. Um, but you're unlikely to come across something that's brand new that you've never seen before in theatre. And you can program it up just before you fly. So if you have any data at all, then, then you can program it. Um, I can't go into the performance aspects of it, unfortunately. Um, sorry, I'd like to. Um, and last time I tried to half answer a question and got shouted at by two VPs. So um, I'm just going to go, sorry, not at liberty to discuss that at the moment. But um, it's quite a modern device. 
I'll let you. I'll let you figure. I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> um, so, in a way, to answer some of your questions, how does it know what to transmit? Well, guess what? We're going to go back to that programming thing again. We've got to program it. We've got to decide what it's going to do, um, when, how, and you know, quite how it's going to operate when it's in theatre. Um, so there's a really naffly named process called TVACD, which is Threat Vulnerability and Countermeasures Design. You can understand why they always abbreviate that one to TVACD. Um, and it follows this kind of loop, which is, well, what do we think is out in theatre? What do we think it does? Um, and, you know, we, that SA8 is sitting in Carlisle. There, there's always the, the, the trick of finding bits of equipment, um, you know, pulling them back for analysis and so on. The Americans have got all sorts of stuff. You know, we sometimes get stuff. I'll let your imaginations run wild on that one. Um, but anything we can find out about the system, about how it might work and what its vulnerability might be based on what we know from before or physics, um, is what we can do to go right. This is how we think this operates. How do we think we'll counter it? And it's amazing if you look at a picture of a weapon system and you look at the antennas, antennas work with physics. You know, they work really well if the antenna size matches with a factor to the frequency you're transmitting. So if you can measure the antenna size, you can work out the frequency it's transmitting. And you know, things like that. It's amazing what you can find out. I did meet a man once whose job was to go around the world go to trade shows um, and find weapon systems and then analyze them, photograph them and analyze them. And he carried, he showed us loads of photos of his work and we had this fantastic, amazing presentation. And in every photo, there was a little Coke bottle on the floor. And eventually one of us went, why, what's your obsession with Coke, mate? And he said, well, you know, he takes it around in his little scruffy anorak in his camera and he looks like a light, you know, a, a train spotter. Um, and he kind of goes up to take a photo and the Coke bottle's a bit in the way. So he puts the Coke bottle down, then he steps back and he takes his photo. And he's now got a size because Coke bottles are a known size. So he uses it, used it for a dimension. So if ever you see any pictures of threats with Coke bottle in the bottom, you'll notice my friend. Um, Marvellous. Anyway, so yeah, so whatever information you can glean or guess. Um, so assess the threat and then go, right, what do we think might work against that type of system? Um, bit of guesswork and then we model it and we try it. Um, I'm not going to go into what this modeling is doing, but it's it's using a, a commercially available system. And basically you can program up, the aircraft is flying here, the threat has this characteristic. Um, if I do nothing, I get the picture on the left um, with all the red and red is dead. Um, so basically I'm heading rightwards as you're looking at the screen. Effectively, each of those pixels drawing that picture is the start point of a missile engagement. So as I fly, they launch from any one of those pixels in the circle. Does it hit the aircraft or miss the aircraft? And red is it hits the aircraft. The aircraft is dead and blue is we survive. Hurrah. Um, but there's not a lot of blue on that left hand picture. So the next one is chaff. So World War II style stuff against whatever weapon this was we were looking at. Chaff is not very effective against this weapon because it knows it's chaff. So that picture is not very different. The next one is bright cloud. So if you have a bright cloud system that's an intelligent system, and yes, we've programmed it up with something that you know is, is fairly benign but should work against this, and then you get to that image. There are still some holes in there. If you head straight towards the threat as it's launching and you don't maneuver, then the bright cloud will drop. It's a gravity fed thing. So the bright cloud will have dropped and as the missile is looking at the bright cloud it will see you and then it will hit you so the moral of that story is if the threat is directly ahead of you and you drop something turn just don't go straight at it so it gives us tactics as well as that kind of thing a little gif on the right is just animating those so that gives us an idea that gives us so this looks good you know we've got a little bit of a tactic don't do that but you still have to go out and try it at some point and if you're lucky you've got somebody's captured that threat and you can then try it in a trial situation but sometimes you are where your question came from the first time you see it is when you're out in theatre and then you've just got to hope that the engineers have done their job well um so that's the bit at the top the tvacd bit what's the threat how does it work how do we think it works what do we think will work and then there's a little line that programs into that and that all gets programmed into the bright cloud and so on so can we improve on where we are now? We can see everything. We know where it is. We've got countermeasures so we can deal with it, but they're all at the minute separate. So what we want to do finally is we want to actually link them all together. Um, so this is the Praetorian defensive aid system on Typhoon. 
So Typhoon is a superb aircraft um, and the Praetorian system was being designed really early in the design when I joined the company. So that's 38 years ago. It's still out there, still working and still going through extra design. We are putting in more and more capability and it's going through a stage of evolution into the next variant. So it's still working and still dealing with all the threats it has to. There are lots of bits in a Praetorian system. You've got the um, radar warner bit, which is we know about. You've got laser warners that can tell you if there's anything pointing a laser at you to find you. Missile warners that are looking for missiles coming at speed in towards the aircraft. They're all linked into a central DAS controller, computer, and then we've got countermeasures. And they include uh, wingtip pods, which have jammers on them to shout, toad decoys, so you've got the thing on the string, um, and chaff and flare to lock those things out. Um, it's about to have bright cloud on it. We're just going through that early stages of um, UK's buying bright clouds for Praetorian, and then we'll start actually operating with those. Um, that then allows the pilot to fly. His system does everything for him, sees where everything is, manages what it's going to do, does it, tells him what it's doing, and occasionally it will give him a kind of beep and go, could you just turn into that angle over there, please? Because, you know, if you do that, then I can do this countermeasure. But otherwise, they just fly. The system does everything else, which is nice. So that's where we are and what we, we do at the minute. Um, but what about going forward? Um, well, yes. Obviously not going to tell you too much about this bit because you'll go and tell your Chinese and Russian friends. Um, please don't. Um, so the next thing coming up, I'm sure you'll have heard of, is uh, it's been called Tempest as the platform. A future combat air system, FCAS um, is the name at the minute. So it's a sixth generation fighter for the UK and other nations. It is an international collaboration, which is always exciting, um, always fraught um, because it's you know dealing with other people in the UK could be quite fun, but when you add in all the cultural stuff as well, it's, it's interesting. Um, we are the design authority as Leonardo for the protection suite, which is excellent. That's where we like to be. So all our history can come through with this. Um, due to enter service in 2035. <sighs> None of this stuff is quick. Um, so 2035, we have to have a system that works. We have to have something that's going to work in the environment of 2035, which we don't know. You know, what will that look like? What will the threats be like? Things change so rapidly. Um, how will things operate? You know, we don't know how this will operate yet. We don't know how the enemy, the adversary will operate. Um, there'll be AI ML stuff around because it's already appearing in lots of these bits of equipment. What difference will that make? Do we have to use it? Do we have to deal with it? So all these questions for this platform that we're trying to answer at the moment. How do we do it? How do you define a system when you don't actually know what the what the environment is it's got to work in? Um, you kind of start with educated guesswork. We know what we know now. We know where things are going to the short term. So then you go, well, what would I do? I'd push this and I'd push that. So what we have to design is a system that allows us to grow, to take all those things in. Um, at the minute, we're going through a phase which is technology demonstrators. So, you know, we think we're going to need a bit that does this. Let's build it. Let's try it. We don't have all the components yet, but let's try it with what we have and see what we get. And then we can grow it a bit more. Um, all our systems are software programmable, data programmable, but we have to be on speed for this. You know, it's got to be changeable and adaptable all the time. And we've got to not preclude anything. So we can't make a decision that goes, oh, well, I know this works. So I'm going to do it that way because it might mean we can't grow it. And then essentially what we do is we employ the brightest engineers we can find and we let them play. We let them innovate and go, right, what do you think? You know, the ollies of the world of the future. I'll be retired by the time this thing comes out. And we've got graduates and IPs coming in doing phenomenal work. One of our 16 year olds designed the fins for the bright cloud way back when and the mechanism to pop them out. And a 17 year old uh, apprentice designed the test rig. So every one of those that goes out goes through her test rig. 17 year old female engineer straight out of school did that. So you think, well, if they're doing stuff like that at 17, this is just, you know, it's going to be fun, isn't it? Um, so that's what we do. We employ the best and the brightest and we let them play. That's what we do. So I've talked a bit longer than I meant to, but I mean, never mind, carry on. So electronic warfare, I think, is a fascinating subject. It's ever changing. I've never had two days the same in all my time. 
ESM systems are there to tell us what's out there. What is it? Where is it? Is it a problem to me? And that allows the air crew to avoid or evade that threat, to run away and helps them see what is the thing. Countermeasure systems provide robust countermeasures to then go, OK, well, I've seen it and it's a problem, but I can deal with that. You're safe. So that keeps them safe. We can link them all together into an integrated DAS and have that all working, optimised together, and then they just get on with their day job. Um, and we program everything through data, so it's endlessly changeable, instantly changeable, um, literally loading new data and off it goes. So it's very quick turnaround. That allows the EW mission to carry on, basically helps them see and keeps them safe. So that, my friends, is a very brief introduction to EW. Um, I'll take any questions and you'll, you'll have to tell us what to do about the times and stuff. But I hope that's given you a flavour for, for that world um, and the kind of things that we, uh, we worry about and deal with. Um, and thank you very much for your time. So we have a, a, a question in the chat, so I'll, I'll kind of start there and then I'll grab some people in the room uh, as well. Um, so I've got a question from uh, Johnny P. Uh, Toad decoys are often a feature in defensive suites. Are they often difficult to recover? If very straightforward, is there perhaps a role for Toad sensors uh, to, like in submarines to give new capability? Good question. Um, so yeah, Toad decoys shouldn't fall off. <laughs> when we first started designing them, we had a few moments uh, and we kept dropping them in fields and have farmers ring us up and go, someone's dropped a bomb in my field because they look like a bomb. Um, but they, yeah, they're designed to stay on the aircraft throughout the mission and you bring them back. And then as you fly somewhere near your runway on, over a bit of grass, you cut it and recover them there. Um, and what you find is you have to put a new cable on, but you can fly them again. Um, they're usually pretty robust and obviously we engineer them to be so. Um, Bright clouds, yeah, quite difficult to find. We have to put bird trackers on to find them. Um, the, the thing about that is there's nothing clever in it, in a way. You program the data up, but that goes as soon as the batteries run out. Um, so it's electronics. Um, I was once asked, well, couldn't someone you know, pick one of those up and reverse engineer it? Well, you could, but we've got about 25 years of investment in that. So good luck with that, um, You know, trying to actually make it work. So. Um, so we're not so worried about recovering bright clouds, but tow decoys should always come back to base with you and then you refurb and fly them again. In terms of other sensors, yeah, submarines already tow kind of stuff behind them. Um, the sensor packages that I've talked about, because they're passive, so they're not transmitting. So actually you can just put them on the platform, just have antennas around and nobody really notices they're there. Um, you know, the, the, the MQ-9B, when we first fitted our antennas, ours were painted grey, standard colour, and the platform there was white, so you could see the antennas. But if we'd actually painted them white, you'd never even know what was there. You just think it was a it was a drone. So, um, yeah, sensor arrays and stuff we tend to have in internally, but countermeasures, yeah, we can recover. So, any questions in the audience? Cool. Uh, sorry, just Oh, right. um, yes, you're quite dismissive of the F-35 and um, and other stealth aircraft. Can can modern radars uh, adapt their transmission quite quickly to defeat them? Um, it's not a quick process. It has to be said. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, that was a bit flippant on me. That I think the F-35 is a superb aircraft that definitely has a role, um, but I think it has a role it's designed for and it will be overcome you know that we will find things that move out fairly quickly um modern radars can certainly adapt how they operate they're more and more programmable they're more and more variable in how they operate so yes they can adapt pretty quickly but to get to the level that they are have that adaption takes takes many years so so if you were to say i'm going to defeat the f-35 you'd be looking at probably years of development to find something that was completely different and would be able to overcome it it, but essentially, all of this is physics. So, you know, anything you can make programmable, you can adapt. Anything that's a physical kind of hardwired, you know, like a stealthy covering on a platform, well, that's that's not easy to adapt. So, which is why I tend to kind of go, yeah, it's good, but um, do it digitally. But is that right. is that a? Okay. Yeah, yes, I, I just wondered if there's a big future still in in stealth. Uh, should we still pursue it? 
Um, yes, there there is, but uh, again, it's going to have to be adaptable. Um, I think James Bond had the best one where he had the car that became invisible by just kind of sensing what was around it and then just projecting it on the screen. So I think if we could work to something like that in radar terms, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, not sure we're quite there yet, but um, yeah, there's making it hard to find is definitely a good thing. You know, if you've got a big aircraft that's really reflective, then they'll know where you are from way out. Whereas if you are small, then you give your adversary less time to adapt and to react to you. So, so stealth is always good. And um, our aircraft, you know, modern aircraft are small. They're a lot smaller than they used to be. But that kind of between small and stealthy is a decision on operational usage, really. Thank you. Uh, I'm oh, uh, can I have a question in the audience? Sorry. <laughs> Do your systems always rely on the pilot to evade? Um, excellent question. So our pilots at the moment really don't like the concept of the aircraft evading for them. Um, you know, they, they have one job and they quite like it. Um, it's it's a bit like your cars. You know, your car automatically brakes for you sometimes and, and avoids going across lanes. Um, I had one of those cars as a hire car and I didn't know how to turn off the lane avoidance thing. Um, and if I didn't indicate early enough to say I'm pulling out now, the car would pull back and not let me go across the lane. And it was infuriating because I thought, no, I want to do that. Don't do it for me. Um, and pilots, you know, they have in their mind a very clear objective and a very clear understanding of when you see that threat, countermeasures go out and you do this maneuver and they know what they're doing and they know how to look and see that it's worked or not and if you ever hear you don't get them so much um on kind of uh youtube and stuff but if you ever hear anybody who's been in an engagement from the cockpit they work massively hard to hurl that aircraft around the sky and change all the angles and if it doesn't immediately work they go straight into another and go again telling a pilot we're going to let the plane do that just at the minute no they don't like it at all we could, you know, the technology would be there to do it, but it's actually overcoming that person. So for something like a, a, an RPAS, a remotely piloted vehicle, yeah, you'll program in evasion maneuvers and, and that will happen automatically. But I, in my lifetime, there's never been any real move to give that to the pilot and say, we'll maneuver for you. It's just, it's just not how they will operate. Choice. Would you, yes, back then. yeah it's yeah that it's always a problem with an expendable um you know and a passive expendable in particular that if your tactic is when you're lit up bang chaff out and helicopters can't get out of the way quickly as you say then you run out because you can physically only carry some um which is where an onboard jammer system or a tow jammer system that can just keep going for as long as you do, you know, has a, a better utility in that space. Um, and you're, then it comes down to the tactics of the conflict. And, you know, I have to say the way the Ukrainians have managed this war and the tactics they've employed have been absolutely spot on. You know, they've learnt, observed, learnt, observed, learnt, you know, and they just know that as soon as they do, you know, light up and it's going to bung chaff out. OK, well, I'll wait two minutes or I'll wait 20 seconds, do it again, do it again, do it again. And when they don't get chaff out right now, I'll shoot. You know, it's it's operational tactics. Any countermeasure you make, someone will come up with a tactic that will beat it. So we then do something to the countermeasure and they then do something to the tactic. We, we used to work in the naval world with that siren decoy, the naval decoy, and we created something that defeated all the missiles that were around at the time. And we were at the same site as what's now become MBDA, but was ours guided weapons at the time. So we did something and went, ha, huh? gotcha. And they went, oh, that's clever. Right, we'll do this. OK, ha, huh? gotcha again. So we had, they had Sea Eagle, we defeated it. They went to Son of Sea Eagle, we defeated it. They went to Super Son of Sea Eagle, we defeated it and eventually they left and became MBDA, which was awkward because we can't talk to them now. Um, but, you know, 
it's not a game. I absolutely do not mean it's a game, but it is always a constant. We've done this, they'll adapt, like the stealth thing. We've made this brilliant stealth fighter, they'll adapt. Right, we're gonna have to do this now, they'll adapt. And it's why, you know, you can't just go and buy a countermeasure system off the shelf that was active 20, 30 years ago. So you can, yeah. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's an obvious thing, isn't it? Right. Yes. Uh, I think we just a couple more questions because uh, it's going a bit late, but I, I, I've got used my advantage of having the mic to, to ask one. Um, <laughs> kind of duty to ask the, the obvious question. So we've got AI, so you've got these kind of new uh, uh, capabilities, deep generative networks that can produce, like in the visual field, like incredible and often arbitrary imagery to high levels of fidelity. So what's to stop you sort of building a, a generative adversarial model that can just produce a arbitrary spectrum in time power that mimics a radar or invents a new radar? So every single missile can pretend to be a very slightly different missile. What's to, how do you deal with that? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, in, you know, in essence, there's nothing that, you know, the, the technology is so amazing at the minute that, you know, you could use a, an AI system to create something new. Um, but then we can also turn that on its head and we can use a similar AI type system to go, well, we know what the world normally looks like. So if anything's different, do something about it. And, you know, much as we would have to go through the cycle of learning, you know, and everything we've programmed into here and all the technology it uses is something we've learned and developed. What the AIML world allows you to do is to speed that process up. So it's effectively allowing this system to do the learning for you. Um, the issue again, much like that, would you maneuver an aircraft on a pilot? Um, from the defensive point of view, would you want an AI system that's making its own mind up and doing what it thinks, but you don't know what it's going to do? So again, there's a bit of hearts and minds in there to go, well, well when do you trust that system to always behave correctly adapt but not adapt too much and you know so and i think again from the weapons system if they you know they could mimic various things they could make it adapt characteristics all the time and you know that that will be difficult for today's systems if we've got a weapon that's going all over the place but by the time that comes in we'll already have the signal processing in that goes we know stuff's going to change can we put the the corollary in so again it's back to that step forward step forward step forward but in principle in principle, AI can do anything you like. The control of it and the trust of it is always the, the slight issue, really. Uh, just double check, no, any, no questions left over. Um, fantastic. So I'll quickly do the vote of thanks. Um, well, the, the incredibly fascinating uh, kind of like whistle stop tour through uh, kind of virtual warfare. Um, sort of like it's good to know the UK is still a world leader in, in something. That's always good to know. <laughs> Yay! <world>. Go us! Yes. <laughs> uh, so having a little trouble kind of following along. And um, it's, yeah, I sort of come from like a so aerospace systems background. And this does very much feel like magic aspirating as technology. It's, yeah. it's a very a kind of a esoteric kind of thing. Uh, fascinating. And it's kind of like a, it's a bit of like James Bond, a little bit of espionage, but it's also like chess as well, yeah. and also a bit of game theory. So there's just lots and lots of stuff things to think about there. And um, yeah, so more hands on than I expected. So that was kind of cool to see. And uh, yeah, no, no, you know, face protecting, face protectors. I think that's a fantastic kind of summary yeah. of what we're doing. So uh, thank you very much for a fantastic job. Okay. And uh, we can sort of uh, give the thanks in a normal way. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Caroline Betts and I've just, for better or worse, been elected as chairman of the branch. Um, I just wanted to advertise next month's lecture, which will be our president's lecture by Peter Curtis, and it'll be on the Aralis modular aircraft. It will be on Thursday, the 8th of December here at 7 p.m. and we hope to have perhaps a few mince pies before we start. <laughs> so some of you may have had a publication of, of the programme which doesn't have the correct date in it, so please make sure you come on the correct Thursday. And in January, we will be having our joint lecture with the Bed Civils Air, 
Engineers Society and that will be on Wednesday the 11th of January and that will be preceded by a buffet if that's any incentive to attend. <laughs> so I do want to thank Bernard um, and every other member of the committee for their work over the last year or so and we look forward to taking the branch from strength to strength. Thank you very much for attending this evening.